How you doing? Good. How's it going, Micah? <laughs> it's going well. Thank you. Nice. Nice to have you. Thanks for doing that. I really appreciate that you take your time to be on here and give a little bit of knowledge to all the tennis folks out there. Yeah, of course. All right. So, uh, Michael, you know, I did during the quarantine, I, I uh, had a lot of those Instagram lives with friends I met through my career, you know, um, so we did we did 50, I think, of those. So it's exciting now. Tomorrow I have uh, Pablo Andujar. Today I have you. So it's, you know, it's, it's uh, going well. So apparently they were not bad. So I'm happy, happy about that. So I saw Andy Brandy. Uh, join us earlier here too. It's one of my mentors, great guy. Andy worked for player development. Uh, Andy, hello again. I just wanted to say hello. And um, yeah, Michael, let's start. So uh, I asked everybody when we do those lies from the very beginning. You know, how how did it start? How did you start with tennis? A lot of a lot of parents from other players started the kids. So how did it start with you? Yeah. So for me, I grew up in a tennis family. So my father taught me how to play. He played collegiate tennis. Okay. Um, in the U.S., he played for University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. And then I have an older brother, three years older, and he also played uh, nationally and then played two years in college. So, and my mother was also a good uh, club player. So, basically, big <laughs> tennis family. Yeah. So, it was so you got right, right into that. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, what's always nice, you know, I have an older brother, too, and I, I was reading, obviously, to prepare. Uh, so he he played in Princeton, right? Your brother for two years. Yeah, exactly. Th that's where my brother did his postdoc in Princeton. So it's, okay. it's a yeah, it's funny. It's like you know, I'm from Germany. I was born and raised there. My parents are from Croatia, and you know, when he went to Princeton, it looks like Harry Potter land. That is so cool. That university, I love it. You know, and the the chemistry building where my brother was is a little bit on the on the side there, but I I, I liked it there. It was a nice atmosphere there. Yeah, the campus is beautiful. Yeah, it's really neat. Uh, that that's that's a really good one. I really enjoyed it there. Um, yeah. So you so you basically you know you you had your parents and then um, and I saw when I was preparing you you went through all the stages in the USTA rankings. You were always like top like you know top in the country. A lot of you know, players and friends of mine like you know Dusan Laovic for example. Yeah. He he wasn't like top top you know in the junior. So everybody develops differently. So. So, um, yeah, so tell us a little bit about those junior years, maybe the journey to, to, to college. Yeah, definitely. So for me, the big change came from 14s to 16 and unders. And that's where I started to get, I paid a lot more attention to my fitness. Mm -hmm. And that really propelled me into finishing, I finished number one in the nation in 16 and unders. um strict um you still am i still with you yeah i'm still yeah, with yeah. You. I, I hear i got you no, i saw a little circle for a second All um, good. Yeah. so that that fitness program that i created when i was 15 16 i continued to have that same mentality into the pros and i continue to still do a ton of fitness today but that was the big impetus between 14s and 16s that really helped me be a top junior player and 16s and 18s i finished in 16s i finished number one and i want to say in 18s i finished three one year and i think one also again mm -hmm. um before i went on to go to university of miami for one year to play college tennis okay yeah as you mentioned the fitness part is so important you know i still have a lot of kids now you know the, the change from 14 15 and 16 the body just changes completely you know what was interesting i was reading when federer had an interview and he said he, he needed a little bit like, you know, when I 17, 18, 19 to find himself because his shot in his head, he had everything already, but his body couldn't execute, you know. And I think that is so important, you know, that that like, you know, you, you, you're known as one of the fittest guys that, you know, was on the tour and the hardest worker. And um, so so that is definitely like, you know, nice to hear. And I hope a lot of juniors hear that as well, because they think going just on the court you know gonna get them better but there's so much more you know so yeah i mean as you know fitness is is one of the few things that you have 100 percent complete control over yeah and in tennis there's so many variables so if you can, can take control of that variable i mean you're already at a big advantage to totally I, i'm 100 percent with it and then the set going a little bit into playing same with the surf you know the, the junior is for me like that's the only shot where they have like what 25 seconds you know, and that, that, that's their world, their time, their routines. Yeah. 
and that's for me too when I teach that is so crucial and important because that's like already half of the of the game if you're good in there so so you went to uh, University of Miami so you, you you've been there one year right is that correct yes yeah and then exactly. and then you you grinded and hustled through through satellites futures challengers so you work your way up too so when I had Monica Puig on there she that's why I like her so much and she she mentioned a really valuable pro, uh, point and a lot of students listen to that you know she said I went through all of the levels, like the, the challengers, futures, from the bottom to the top. And that's why I can appreciate where I am. And that's when I play bad, I can find my way back. What do you say to that? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I had to work through all those levels. Um, a lot of weeks traveling by myself um, in foreign countries. You know, not only is the language different, but, you know, different cultures you're on your own you got to fend yeah. for yourself and you know it makes you tougher you know it makes you yeah. appreciate once you get to those higher levels that you know all that hard work and it makes you want to work even harder so i um exactly what monica said i mean it, it's really good for that self-motivation yeah and talking about resilience and usda player development you know that's one of the biggest things i have a lot of friends there you know and uh you know, and Andy was there, and then and, and I've been myself a little bit there, and I like, I, I like that mentality. So, so with player development, so um, you know, which players did you, you know, get get in touch with, and which which players did you work with? Tell us a little bit about player development. Yeah. So when I first started in 2017, mm -hmm. um, I actually started off. Actually, in 2016, I did a preseason camp in Carson. Mm -hmm. and where I worked with a whole bunch of different guys, you know, getting ready for Australia. So while I was there, this was in, in 2016, it was Stevie Johnson, mm -hmm. um, Taylor Fritz, uh, Sam Query was there, Ernesto Escobedo. Mm -hmm. uh, so a whole bunch of guys getting ready. And then specifically, 2017, um, I started working with Francis Tiafo. And I worked also helping helping Francis so that was a lot of fun um, really helping to mentor Francis and get him a little more comfortable playing on the ATP level you mm -hmm. know he's such a nice guy and you know oh, yeah. at the time at the time he was a little bit more of like a kid in a candy store or just like hey I'm on the ATP level yeah you know, oh, hey there's Roger there's Rafa you know I grew up watching these guys where <laughs> and you kind of you had to make him realize that yeah that's great that you see your, you know, some of your idols and some of the guys that you look up to, but at the same time, you actually have to think that you can beat those guys. Yeah. Um, and then 2018, I worked with Ryan Harrison. Mm -hmm. um, Lu along, Louisiana, Louisiana yeah, boy. Exactly. I, I, I'm based, I'm based here in Louisiana. That's why I like. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and then a few weeks, I also helped out Taylor Fritz and mm -hmm. Sam Query mm -hmm. in the fall. And then, uh, 2019 with Mackenzie McDonald, who mm -hmm. I still coach now, along with Matt Clower. And then Tennis Sangren, I started helping tennis uh, just after Wimbledon last year. Oh, wow. I yeah, tennis. To help him now, yeah. Yeah, it's when I watch, like, his battles there at the Australian Open, and, like, he's, 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 like, he's a beast, man. Like, <laughs> yeah, he's a warrior, for sure. Yeah, he's a Definitely. And I watched some of those Instagram lives he had. Uh, he, he seems like a, I never met him in person. He seems like a, like a great guy. And yeah. I think I, be, I believe you've been to Delray, right, this year before the Corona stuff happened? Yes. Yeah, that that's was. where I saw you yeah. there. My friend uh, Ante Pavic, he played doubles there okay. um, with Kecmanovic. And then all the other guys like Zumur and all those guys were there. So I, I think, yeah, that's I, I saw you there. Uh, that was fun, though. I, like the Delray tournament. A lot of people don't know about that's one of the tournaments I, I like. They have the basketball court in there and all the guys right. just yeah. having fun. You know, I think that's so important, too. You were talking about Francis. You know, I know Zach now a little bit, too. And, you know, it's, I think it's, it's so important to have a happy balance between, you know, the, the, the hard work when you're working and then, then making the player feel comfortable, you know, and, like, making them feel like, you know, yeah, this is where I belong and I feel good where I am, you know. So the same with... Um, I don't know, Petr Popovic, the, the coach yeah. of Zumor, you know, when they work, they like, you know, they work like 2000%. And then when they're off court, you know, they're a little bit more relaxed. And that's what I, what I liked really about this Del Rey tournament, that everybody was like, they're working hard, but off court, everybody was kind of together. And Yeah, exactly. It creates that relaxed atmosphere. And then 
especially with the coach player. I mean, you spend a lot of time together, so you got to make sure it's almost like basically you're part of a family. So yeah, you want to be strict. You want to have that hard work, but at the same time, you want to make sure that they know that you do care about them. And there's, there's that uh, sympathy and empathy where, you know, you understand the, the stresses and some of the difficulties that they're going through. So Michael, what, what would you, so you, you coach now a couple of years, obviously. So what, what, what did you learn in the coaching years? What might have helped you while you were still playing? I mean, you've been top 60 player. I want to come to that a little bit uh, later, but like, what, what, what is it like, what you learned maybe in those years of coaching, what might have helped you in your playing career? Is there anything, or maybe there's nothing? Well, I mean, a lot of it is the patience part. Um, you know, I'm a little bit OCD. Um, I always have a lot of energy, <laughs> yeah. but you know, I think sometimes, especially as a player, you're always, you're kind of looking for that magic pill or, you know, so, for me, um, sometimes I tinkered a little bit too much. I was known to tinker a little bit too much, maybe with my equipment, um, and some of the other things. And instead of just saying, no, you know, I use that equipment. You're good mm -hmm. with that. Just keep continuing to put the hard work in yeah. and, and, and keep progressing and just trust in it. So I think sometimes looking for that magic pill, and I, I find it a lot with the players I work with, you know, sometimes, you know, they're like, oh, what about this string? Or what about this racket? Or mm -hmm. add a little bit of weight here, you know, which sometimes that tinkering can help. But in general, it's, it's, it's just the hard work. It's the, the daily, yeah, the daily exactly. repetition and hustle exactly. and grind, right? Yeah, the same. What I like when Uncle Tony, when he said, like, you know, when when Rafa was younger, he on purpose gave him all the the, the like shit, shitty balls, you know, yeah. so he doesn't complain about anything. He learns to play with those, you know, and that's that's one thing, you know, I'm I'm missing a little bit in the, especially in the junior years, you know, I mean, I have some junior players, they they have balls that are played maybe three times, you know, and they're like, hey, you know, coach, what is that? And you know, it's so hard, you know. I mean, like, I don't know, it's just sometimes it's just hard to see, you know, the, the generation Xbox, PlayStation, cell phones, right? And yeah, and and but but I think I guess the guys that make it, they don't have that mentality. Most of them anyway, like, you know, they, they found a way to to be yeah. better than the other guys. They're, so. they're allowed to, they found a way that the distractions mm -hmm. and the stimulus from some of the games and the cell phones aren't actually making an impact on the tennis court. You know, they're able to separate those two and still stay focused. Or you can see sometimes even some of the juniors I work with, you can see the focus starts to wane after, you know, five, ten minutes because there's so much stimuli that they're always used to. Yeah. So it's, it's really important to, you know, to try to limit the, you know, right now it's great to be on social media, especially watching us. You know, yeah. that's important. Defi but, no, definitely. Like during those times, you know, that's yeah. why I started those two. Because, I mean, like from you – I mean, I had Emilio Sanchez, Jumu, Alaovic, you know, all those guys. And then all the coaches, too, like, they, they give knowledge you usually don't get, right? So that's why right. I'm so thankful, you know. Uh, yeah. That's why I contacted you and the other guys, and that was just a great timing uh, to, to, to get you on here. So you've been, like, one of the fittest guys, like, on still, you're still one of the fittest guys out there. So, you know, when, when, when people tell me always that the mental part is the most important thing, you know, I'm always – cautious because like for me like the, the fitness part you know you can be mentally strong but if you physically i always say it that way if you have two people who are physically on the same level yes then the mental part decides right but yeah. but that that's what the the junior kids especially when the, the the upcoming kids they don't understand that you know they think you know without hard work you know i'm gonna get up there and t and, and the talent just brings you to a certain point yeah right? no so, for sure for sure i mean you have to have the fitness you have to have the hard work and even some of the players on tour that, you know, some of the guys make it look like they don't work that hard, you know, they, the way they act and stuff. Yeah. But those guys actually have put all the hours in in juniors. Yeah. You know, they're a lot of times what the public doesn't see, they're actually working out at the gym a lot. So, I mean, they're behind the doors, behind the cameras. Everybody's putting in a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I had in Germany, I was a guy. His name is Jan Weinziel. He's around your age, maybe a little bit older. He was like 200 in the world. But, you know, talently wise, maybe not the most talented guy, but like he had his work ethic is just unreal. Like, you know, yeah. so that's, 
you can get to a certain point with working hard. You know, I want the, the kids that watch that later on, I want them to understand you put your work in, you will be successful. Exactly. And, you, and like we talked before, it gives you that advantage. And not only does it make you, you're fitter, so you're able to play longer matches, you're able to be more uh, explosive on the tennis court, but it also it helps your mind. The fitter you yeah. are, it makes you mentally tougher because you know you can withstand more physical tennis. Yeah. So what what are your thoughts on that? When you look at Novak, right? I mean, he does everything, the, the, the yoga, the food and everything. So he... He, he found for himself, you know, like his balance, but, but others might see it as exaggerated. You know, I mean, you know, like, so, so where do you see, like, you know, what is a healthy balance between like, you know, maybe doing too much or not too much? Like, you know, like with the, yeah, I mean, your concept? a lot of it is just also finding what works for you, you know, finding that experience. And sometimes that's trial and error. So for me, you know, in the beginning, as a junior, I did a ton of fitness and sometimes probably too much, you know, because I was back then it was like if somebody said jumping rope was good for you, running was good for you and mm -hmm. lifting weights was good for you. I did all three of those in the same day, <laughs> you know, as opposed to like having a schedule. I, I, I love that. I love it. Man. <laughs> so, so now, obviously, I'm a, I'm a lot smarter. And so, you know, I have a plan and I do the periodization and it all works out a lot better. So. You know, I think Novak's done a great job of, of finding that balance, what works for him. And even though some of the things that he does, you know, we might see as, as extreme, mm -hmm. it helps him psych psychologically because he knows, okay, I, I did this one hour yoga session. Mm -hmm. I have this special diet. I have these, you know, special apparatuses that I used to work out with, mm -hmm. you know, and at five all in the fifth, he's thinking, you know what? I did this and my opponent hasn't done this. And that's what's giving me the advantage, you know, even if it hasn't, but psychologically he thinks yeah. that, and that really gives him that, that benefit and that advantage. Like those placebo pills. Like he, exactly. he thinks, he th yeah. that's a, that's a great, that's a great point. And coming a little bit to your playing career. So fourth round of uh, French open was your, your biggest success on, in the slams. And I know it might hurt, like, but you were two sets up against Guga, right? I didn't. I was. <laughs> yeah, and then you had match. I know. I'm sorry, I, but like it's, it's no, amazing because no, yeah. I, I I didn't even remember that you had you 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 were right there to to beat him, and obviously that happens. I mean, it happened at the Australian Open. Who played against Feder? Was it um, Millman? Was well, and it? and Millman and and Sangren. Who I and Sangren, yeah. So yeah, you know, so that stuff happens, and as you know, it goes. It happens sometimes yeah. for you, sometimes for the other person. So I know, but but fourth round French Open. So tell us a little bit. Uh, about the atmosphere at the French Open and the, being in the fourth round and playing like Guga there. I mean, like that must be completely unreal. Yeah, no, it was crazy. And, that, and part of the story, I don't know if you know, is that I came through the qualifying that year. I, I don't, that's what I wanted to tell the people. I was okay, reading, okay. you qualified for all majors in that year. That is yeah. crazy. Yeah. And then who knows, everybody who knows how tough qualifying already. So yeah. I played Futures. That was already like, and then qualifying for our majors, like, you know, I was, yeah, just wanted to you. let the people know. Thank you. Yeah. And then, and so first, first round of that mm -hmm. 2001 Roland Garros, I was down match point. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So it was a little bit crazy. Who did you, so, who did you play in the first round? Who was that? Um, French player, Olivier Pechance. Mm -hmm. So, okay. yeah. So I, I think he actually coaches, I think a little bit. Um, I've seen him on the WTA tour coaching some of the girls. So okay, so and how so how is it? Let's let's go on the first one. How is it to play a French guy at the French Open? I always had that question. So so obviously the crowd is cheering against you. Yeah. You on your you on your own now. You match point down. How did you get out of it? <laughs> lucky. I mean, that was that honestly that match point. I was very lucky because he played a great point. Ended up missing a shot barely. You know, came in missed a volley by about <laughs> two inches. Um, oh. And then I kind of freed up a little bit because I felt like I had a second life. Mm -hmm. And then I started playing great. He got a little more tentative. Mm -hmm. And then I, I ended up winning the third set pretty handily. Nice. So it was pretty wild. So, but the funny thing is you ask about that. And mm -hmm. that same year, third round, before I played Guga, I played Xavier Melisse. Oh, yeah. Be from from Bel Belgium, from right? From Belgium. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And we played on court two, which held about 3,000 people. And there were about 3,200 people there. 
<laughs> and they were, yeah, they were like hanging off the side of the court with flags. They, they were actually louder than any of the French crowd that I ever played against. <laughs> That's funny. That was great. Yeah, that was an unbelievable atmosphere when I played against uh, Xavier at the French. And then the next round, yeah, I mean, playing Guga center court, and especially at that time, because I'm coming in as a qualifier, mm -hmm. really nobody knew who I was. So Guga and his coach, I saw his coach before the match, the day before, mm -hmm. and he was kind of like, you know, giving me a high five. Great job. Oh, it's so good. You got to the fourth <laughs> round. You know, I mean, kind of basically yeah. saying, like, okay, yeah, we're going to kill you, you know. Like, yeah. probably... <laughs> that was so funny. Yeah. So then I started, you know, I started winning. And then, you know, Guga started panicking a little bit. And, you know, his coach is freaking out. And then, you know, the, the stands started getting more and more packed. And all of a sudden, you know, Philip Chatrier is packed. The whole stadium was packed. And so it was, it was an incredible atmosphere. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like. That's so. So, out of all the slams, which one did you, which, which one did you like the most to play? I mean, you know, like I, I've been to the French Open. I haven't been to the Australian Open. I hear, you know, only great things about the, uh, the Australian Open. What is your favorite? It's a good question because so many of the slams, there's so many different positives from each one. Um, I mean, Wimbledon has the history and the tradition. Yeah. So that's really special and. It, For me, I, I love diving all over the place on the grass. Yeah, that's why so I took the picture yeah. when you were diving there. For <laughs> yeah. And you, you never really get to practice and play on grass. So that's it's so unique. So it's kind of like, okay, I have three weeks of the year and I'm playing at Wimbledon. So that's cool. Wimbledon always, yeah, Wimbledon always kind of had a special place. And then, you know, it, it's kind of like you're saying, it's kind of like asking you, what's your favorite, you know, if you love vanilla ice cream, what's your favorite vanilla ice cream? You know, I'm like, All four slams, they're, they're so great, yeah. and they offer different things. Australia, the crowd is amazing, you know, because everybody really gets into tennis. They're very tennis knowledgeable, you know, and they're very vocal. Nice. So you get, like, all the different countries come out with their flags, and they dress up, and, I mean, it's really neat. The French is beautiful. It's the best, you know, the, the red clay is perfect. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, and then the U.S. Open – Obviously, it's my home slam, so that's yeah. always fun. Spe special playing. event. Like crowd, yeah, exactly. Are you in Texas right now? Are you based in Texas? Uh, I'm based in Houston. Houston. So, okay. So, that's what, another question I wanted to ask you. You know, I have a lot of friends who still play on tour, a lot of them. And I tell them always, hey, if you have issues and trouble with the heat at the, uh, at the US Open, come to Louisiana <laughs> yeah, before exactly. the tournament. And no one yet came. I have look. I can name you 30 people who still playing. If some of the guys watches that, you know, like like you know, like in Houston right now, it's just unreal with the humidity. You know, like so, is the U.S. Open really like? I mean, I've been a couple of times, but I never played. Is it really as bad there when it's humid there? Or I mean, we are used to, you know. Yeah, it can be. I mean, the thing is, obviously, you and I being in, I mean, Louisiana, being in Texas, Texas we yeah. get those, you know, 100 degree. Yeah. temperatures with 80% humidity, which is crazy. 80 is good. We had 96 in the morning, you know. It's yeah, like... exactly. <laughs> the thing is, especially um, US Open 2018, mm -hmm. when it was like the courts were a little bit slower. Yeah. And it had those like five days where it was 90 degrees and high yeah. humidity. No, the no. guys aren't used to it. And also because there's so much concrete, mm -hmm. you know, like the steel and the concrete, the heat yeah. just radiates off the court. Okay. And then, of course, you combine that with three out of five sets, the stress of playing, and then that, that, that just okay. amplifies everything. Right. But having some of the guys coming to Louisiana couldn't harm them, right? That would, they're probably scared. They're yeah, probably scared they are. The yeah, I'm, I'm, still sure. I'm still scared. I'm living here. I'm still scared of Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> all, right, all right. What else do we have? Oh, I asked everybody, you know, do you have any favorite, like, drill or anything you like to do on the court? That, that you do almost in every session with the players or what you did when you were a player? You know, I asked when I saw, you know, Carlos Moya, for example, he, they loved always, when I was uh, playing, I was in, um, in Munich at the tennis academy, at Pilich Tennis Academy, and then we went to Umak always for the tournament there. And then Moya was always throwing his frisbee for a warm-up. I like that, you know, it couldn't bounce, obviously, yeah. they, they were playing frisbee. Do you have any games or any drills you like to do on court? Well, I mean, one of my favorite drills is where I'm in net and I'm volleying, mm -hmm. and, I and I have the player just literally crush forehands at my chest. 
<laughs> you know, and literally, I try to. We're on me. the same page. I like the same yeah. stuff. I like. <laughs> so I love that. So then, you know, it's all about working on acceleration and, and working on getting the weight transfer and power into the shot. Okay. And I mean, it's good for me too, obviously, because I'm volleying and I, I'm able to volley everything back, and it's it's a great fitness drill as well because they have to accelerate the whole yeah. time. And they're you know, and then we you exhausted can after that. Exactly, and you can adjust it. To, you know, depending on the level of the player and. And then for the volley as well, like you can surf to the volley. It's another good one for the volley. Yeah, you know, you surf, exactly. surf to the volley. I like, I like those two. Yeah. And that's great because I got so many. I, I'm, I'm, I'm putting them all together in a little book, and then I'm gonna just release it on my on my channel because that's I good. thought it was cool and a cool idea. You know, like I had so many different uh, inputs, and uh, no, that's that's a good one. So, um, yeah. So you know, what what did you do during the, the COVID? How did you stay fit? That's what I wanted to ask you to uh, ask the guys. Could you do your workouts or did, did, how did you stay in shape? Yeah, so obviously it's been, you know, difficult for everyone because we have to, you know, spend more time at home and, and stay safe and social distance and a lot of the, the gyms and the clubs closed down. So mm -hmm. fortunately, um, created a gym at home. So we have some cardio equipment. We have a spin bike. Mm -hmm. um, I have an elliptical. I have a Versa climber, which I love. That's that's brutal. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I love that thing. And then we have dumbbells. You know, they go from five pounds all the way up to like sixty. Um, I have the TRX. Mm -hmm. so I don't know if you're yeah, familiar with the TRX. Yeah. Just, yeah. And then um, I have a pull-up bar that I installed into the door frame. All right. So, so you're fully, think, full, fully equipped. Yeah. So I do. I know. I do a lot of body weight exercises. Um, yeah. I, I push up bars, you know, and I, I, I usually don't advocate doing a lot of chest work as a tennis player, but now that I'm coaching, obviously it doesn't, I can do that for me. It doesn't matter so much. So <laughs> I'm doing a lot of body weight stuff, uh, pull ups, push ups, use the dumbbells and, um, just, just making sure I get after it every day because especially in these times where it's, a, you know, it can be a little more stressful. Uh, getting yeah. that workout in every day gives you peace of mind too. Exactly, yeah. exactly. No, that no, that's great. And then, Michael, what I wanted to ask you, like you know, since well, I started Tennis House 2016, you know, and just grew, and like you know, I got I get coaching drills from from the best coaches in the world. Now I just share, and you know, I should put a little bit of my stuff in. And I started to do conferences as well, you know, like tennis conferences. So I had Emilio Sanchez, Eric Buderak was at mine. Uh, Douglas Cordero, who's the fitness coach of uh, of team, uh, really great guys. Arancha was last year, my friend Arancha. If I wanted to ask you, if you have, I didn't know even that you're so close. If you're ever interested, and you know when we can hold conferences again, we have a beautiful club. If you would ever be interested to maybe you know present, that would be awesome. Since I have you already on here, you know it's like an hour flight yeah. from you, not even. And uh, yeah, that that would be really cool to yeah, have thank you. Thank you. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, well. Hopefully we can get the uh, we'll get the COVID under control uh, yeah. sooner rather than later. And, I know uh, with you guys in Texas, it's it's tough right now, huh? Yeah, it's the growing. cases have been going up. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the people haven't been real responsible, and some of the bars and and restaurants they've been going and just acting as if nothing is going on. And so, unfortunately, the cases have increased, and you know we kind of backtracked a little bit, and now there's kind of a stay-at-home advisory yeah so it's not a mandate but you know you, you got to be careful i mean people should wear masks when they go yeah. out and yeah. social distance and just you know be careful and be be mindful of other people you know, that's the main yeah, thing that, that's it exactly be mindful that's uh, i think that's missing in our world a little bit but that's a different story um last thing i wanted to ask you michael um looking you know social media right so um what is your thoughts from, from, for me, you know, look, I, I do it now since five years and I think I reach so many guys and, and it, it helps a lot of people. What, what is your thought on, you know, I mean, t everybody thinks tennis. Yeah. We have Rafa, we have Novak, we have Federer, but those guys going to be gone one day and tennis is on the bottom, right? The peer of the bottom of the pyramid is so important. And I think with social media, having you now on, for example, you know, so many kids going to watch that and going to be like, Oh, or Michael Russell, and they go back and look who you were, who you played. I think that is so important. So what, what is your take on, on, on social media if you use it healthy? Like not yeah, the no, no, I'm, I'm a big fan of social media because I think it helps create 
you know, that, that newsworthy items, you know, it yeah. gets the word out. It creates um, awareness. So, you know, it gets people, oh, look at this, the way this guy plays or look at his attitude. Right? I yeah. like the way that he does this. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know, you know, let, let's say your favorite player is Dominic Team. Oh, I didn't know these were his hobbies. I, I love the same thing, you know? Yeah. So it, it creates that information and it creates newsworthy, newsworthy items where, yeah, I, I like that guy. I want to follow him or I like the way he plays. Yeah. And, you know, I, I use social media to get a lot of my news, actually. Yeah. You know, I, I'll use Twitter to get my news. Um, and then it's, you know, Instagram is great to see what's going on, what people are doing, what yeah. events are taking place. You know, so it's just it's a great way to stay in touch, see how things are developing throughout the world, what people are doing and um, to stay relevant, you know, and, and follow some of your favorite athletes. Yeah, I agree. I think that is so important. And uh, yeah, like as I said, you know, uh, you know, you, to, to get a big following, most of them have to, you know, they have to spend some time on it. So for all my followers who, who, who are watching this, it's going to be safe and they will watch it you know, follow Michael's account, like, you know, get some good stuff in there too. And, um, and I can't thank you enough that you, that you took your time to do that, Michael. I really appreciate it. I hope I see you in the future. One of the tournaments when the COVID is under control, I, you know, I'm like my, my son's five now. Now I feel like I can go sometimes again and travel a little bit and see all my old friends playing on tour. So I really hope, uh, I, I can see you and meet you in person too. No, I, I appreciate you having me on, and, and like you said, yeah, I look forward to seeing you at one of the tournaments, and, and hopefully, hopefully it can happen soon in a, in a safe yeah. manner, and uh, I look forward to doing it again. Thank you so much. If you ever, Mike, if you ever need anything to be pushed out, contact me. I'm always here. You know, like, you know, we reach, like, on all channels, over 100,000 now, and all of them on Facebook and everything. I'm always here. I, I think it's really kind of you. You know, so many players I reached out. There were a lot I didn't know, you know, and they were so kind and did it. Like Pablo Anduja, I didn't know, but I had inter interviews. I'm good friends with Emilio Narancha, so yeah. everybody knows each other, you know. I think it's a, it's, it's a great deal. And, uh, yeah. yeah, and then everybody who was joining us today, you know, um, you see they're all thankful for that great interview. Nice to hear from you, Michael Russell, you know. <laughs> thank you, both of you, for your time. And um, it's, it's just cool to do that. So, yeah, I'm always here if you need anything to be promoted, Michael. And uh, thanks to keep up the amazing work you do with the players. And, and I hope they just get 5% of what your work ethic was and then they will be successful. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thanks, Thank Michael. You. I appreciate it. Have a great night. Thank you. You too. Thanks. Bye.